Hello everyone and welcome back to C++. Sorry about not being here for a while with these tutorials, but I'm back and today we're talking about variables. So, let's get started real quick. Variables are a way to store data inside of a program. And a program, or programming in general, would actually be very, very useless without variables. They're a very, very important part of programming. And when you start out, it's really good to make sure that you get a very good hang on them before you move on, simply because if you move on with programming without a very good understanding of variables, you're going to run into errors that you don't really understand, you're not sure why they're happening, it's not going to explain it very well, a lot of times it won't actually err, it'll just produce unexpected results in your program, and so it's really good to understand why they behave the way they behave, and also how to use them before you move on with programming. So, the simplest, uh, oh, real quick, this is our program from last time, we're pretty close to it. It's a real simple hello world program. If we run it, it says hello C++. Every time we run it, it's the same, and it really doesn't do much. The user, it doesn't have much uh, functionality. The user can't do much. So what if we were to make something like a calculator, uh, something that would actually do some math, something that we might see as a little bit more useful or more functional. So that brings in the idea of variables. So we can delete this line real quick. Don't really need it anymore. Variables are basically boxes in which to store things. So we will have, uh, when we go into actually uh, like exploitations, reverse engineering, looking at assembly, we will do a very, very in-depth um, look into memory and memory allocation and memory formatting and how uh, things in memory work and how the stack works and what's the difference between the stack and the heap and how you can put assembly commands and run through them sequentially and how things jump and how memory addresses actually work, all that really fun stuff when we get actually to an area where we have the background, we, we've seen the front end and we can understand the back end by knowing how it manifests itself in things that we can observe. However, for now, um, just imagine memory as a real blank sheet of paper, nice sheet of normal, normal paper, and uh, you have a pen and you can write on it. Now, we can make a cool hard drive analogy saying that, you know, the finer your pen is, the smaller you're able to write, the more data you're able to fit on that page. But just for the sake of this argument, let's pretend that uh, everybody writes on paper the exact same with the exact same handwriting at the exact same size with the exact same pen or pencil or your favorite instrument of writing, I don't know, chapstick. And you're able to uh, have some kind of unified measurement of that. We'll call it bits. We'll call each each uh, little character that you can write a bit. And say you're only capable of writing ones and zeros. You can only write ones and zeros on your paper. Okay, so a bit can either be a one or a zero, and we can have multiple bits. And the other thing you can do is you can draw boxes around uh, areas that you know will fit a certain amount of your bits. All your bits are spaced evenly and can run concurrently. And when you want to, you can erase those boxes and redraw them or draw different boxes as you please. Now you understand memory. Basically, imagine that page and imagine that you can fit a thousand different characters onto it, a thousand bits or a thousand pieces of binary. Now you've probably seen in movies or TV shows or CSI Miami, or if you've done programming, you've definitely seen this, uh, or if you've done a comp sci class or are in a comp sci class, you've definitely been exposed to this. Binary, the idea that computers think like this. They think in ones and zeros. And the reason is because computers, uh, as digital items, this is a digital signal, work with electricity, which is either on or off. Now, computers can understand a number like 3 because they can convert it to binary and use it as their binary equivalent, which it would be 1-1. One, one. So, by understanding how a computer can actually use that binary, we can begin to understand how what we do is manifested in memory. So, we have certain data types. They're, they're names that we give certain sizes of boxes that we can draw on our paper. And so C++ has many different implementations built by different people, different compilers, different linkers, uh, and different operating systems, different platforms, uh, different types of processors that it runs on. And so these implementations are made by different people. However, it is standardized. There is a central authority of sorts which dictates requirements for the language. Extra things can be added in some implementations of C++, for example, C++11. There's a lot of cool things introduced that weren't in C++98 from 1998 and 2011, respectively. 
And uh, what you can do with these new things that are added are dictated by the people making the implementation. They're standardized, however there's variance. Now, an integer, like we're going to create, uh, when you think of an integer in math, you think of a whole number, a, a no decimals, whole number. Uh, in computer science, however, due to the limitations of memory and the fact that, unlike the human imagination, computer memory is actually quite limited, um, not necessarily limited to the point where it's, you know, a scarce resource at all when programming, but limited uh, on the idea that, you know, we have to be careful of the limits imposed on us by the implementation for our code. So, rather than just give it away, I'm we're going to actually discover how many bits this implementation gives an integer. But, um, just to start it off with, I'm just going to say an integer has 8. It doesn't have 8, it has more than 8 which we're going to uh, quickly discover and then I'm going to explain that this actually has more than the normal implementation or the standardized minimum requirement. However, uh, real quick, we'll just jump into some code here so we can get a better grasp on what we're doing. So, int myNum equals 4. What did I do? I declared an integer called myNum and set it equal to 4. I drew a box on my paper of a certain size. Um, for the sake of argument, we're going with 8, 8 bits. So I drew it in an area that would allow me to write eight different ones or zeros in that area, equally spaced. And I can't, like, cheat and cram more data in there. It doesn't really work that way. So my num equals four. And what I did is I told the system, hey, that box is called my num. This is, of course, a simplification, but I'm telling the computer, yeah, that box there is called my num. And whenever I call my num, that's the box. And so my num is basically um, set equal to a memory address. A memory address explains or um, gives the location of that box. It describes where that box is, how to get to it. It's like driving instructions. A memory address is the same way. So whenever we call myNum, the computer knows where to look. It knows to look in that box and read that binary. However, just being able to declare an integer wouldn't really be very useful unless we actually start using it. So there's an idea of signing in binary. So say we have a binary like this. Binary will usually come in sets of uh, powers of 2. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. You've probably noticed when buying like a memory card for your camera, a thumb drive, a solid state drive, that it comes in those increments. You'll notice that magnetic hard drives don't really give much of a crap about those increments uh, due to what's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But... Um, you'll notice that memory comes often in powers of two. And so this this eight binary bits is called a byte. You've probably heard of a byte, gigabyte, megabyte, kilobyte. It's a major size. And um, these bytes allow us to uh, store data. The, these eight bytes represent a certain number. What we can do is we can take one of these, say this one, this particular digit, and call that the signing digit which is the digit that signs the number. By sign, I mean negative or positive. Now, you'll notice that if I dedicate this one to signing, all of a sudden I can only actually express numbers with the... Oh, numbers with these seven digits, and this one is reserved. It's reserved for signing. Um, so it can be positive or negative and we define that with a binary digit. Whether it's positive or negative, we look at the first one to tell us which one it is. So we're left with only seven digits that we can actually put a number in. The eighth one is reserved and it's set off to the side. So it's still contingent to that memory, it's still in the same area, but however, we're seeing that as a um, very, uh, as suddenly losing half of our storage space because uh, 2 to the 7th is 1 half of 2 to the 8th. If you want to type that into a calculator, feel free. Again, we'll explain more on that when we actually get into really talking about memory, but by taking this bit and reclaiming it, by making it an unsigned integer, we, we have more total, a higher total number we can get to, but we can't make it negative. So it's, it's a um, plus and a minus. It just depends on... <laughs> puns. It really depends on what you're using it for. If you know you, you're never going to have a negative number in that, go ahead, use unsigned, be a little bit more efficient in memory. However, 
if you are not sure, definitely don't mess with using unsigned when you're not sure because unsigned has some very uh, interesting behaviors. So, uh, real quick, I'm just going to show you uh, how you access this. See out my num. See out end. Remember, this is a stream insertion operator, so it takes whatever's to the immediate right of it and throws it into that stream. When it hits the end, it, it hopes that everything's flushed. And, and gone downstream, but if it hasn't, it throws in a bucket of water and kind of pushes it downstream. So let's just run this real quick, see what it does. It should just print out four on the screen and then quit. Yep, and it does. Perfect. So we were able to access this name. It's like saying, hey, my num, what number are you? All right, throw that into this stream. That's what it's doing. It's looking at the memory address. It's going to that memory address that my num is situated at, where that box occurs on that piece of paper. It's saying, hey, I'm going to take your contents and I'm going to throw them into the stream. I'm going to make a copy. You still get to keep your contents. We're not removing them, we're not deleting them, we're not overwriting them. But I want a copy that I can then use and give to the stream guy who's kind of bothering me saying, hey, I need to send this thing called my num. Do you know what it is? So let's take that out real quick and let's take this out. And let's define an unsigned integer. My unsigned num equals 1 see out my unsigned num and all. So that should print out one, right? One doesn't have a negative sign on it. Everything should be great. And it prints out one. Everything is perfect. What if we put a negative there though? What if we give it negative one? Let's run it real quick and see. Oh, I need to build and then run. <laughs> Let's build and run. And you'll notice it gives us this number. 4,294,967,295. Interesting. Let's open up our calculator. And, oh, this does not have the ability to do powers. Okay, we'll have to... 4, 8, 16, 32. Yeah, that's not what I wanted to do. Well, if you take a, a calculator that will allow you to do actual, um, and actually, you know what, I'll pull up one here. Calc. Here we go. Okay. So we have this calculator, and let's put it into scientific mode. If we do 2 to the power of 32, you notice that number looks pretty familiar. 429, 496, 7296. So it's 1 off. Interesting, the absolute value of our number is 1. What if we put a 7 in here? And stopped it. Build and run. And let's get our calculator back real quick. 289, 296. 96 minus 89 is 7. What a surprise. So you'll see what it's doing is it's saying that um, it's, it's going negative. And so it's signing that first integer, or sorry, that first bit in memory. So say um, our int look like Okay, well, actually, let's let's do this true. That would be seven, four, five. So that would be an octet. That would be eight bits, or that'd be one byte. That's what it looks like in memory. Pretending an int is only eight bits right now, which it isn't. But making it negative says, oh, let's sign it. So we'll make this a one, because the the one in that starting position represents a negative. A zero represents a positive. So it puts a one here. But then when the system reads that back, it reads this unsigned. So it doesn't know that this first digit is meant to sign, so it takes the actual value of this, which would be the eighth spot, which is kind of a big number. So what you'll notice is that this number is very, very close to 2 to the 32nd power. Now the total storage capacity, or the total number of possibilities, I should say, of a given length of binary is 2 to the length, because it just like... Um, if we had three digits in decimal, it'd be 10 to the third, because our radix is 10, our number system goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it has 10 total digits that it can work with. Likewise, binary has 2, so it puts 2 to the power of the length. So 10 to the third, 2 to the third. A three-digit number in decimal can store 1,000 different possibilities, and binary can store 8. It makes binary seem less efficient, except when you think about that, binary is able to actually run on a machine whereas decimal really isn't because it doesn't coincide with anything the 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 classic ideals of digital computation long story short by putting that one there we've overflowed 
um, or not overflowed per se, but we've done something that was unexpected and that the machine interpreted incorrectly. Or what it saw as correctly, but it was, we saw it was very, very unpredictable. So what did it do? It put this one here, it signed it, and then it put these here. So now all of a sudden these are subtracted from it. So when you sign it, then all of a sudden you invert these to calculate the actual number. So all these ones, zeros were changed to ones. All these ones were changed to zeros, five, six, seven, eight. And all of a sudden it evaluates to the maximum total minus seven, the maximum storage. So since two to the 32 allowed us to um, get extremely close to this number, I mean, if, if the negative zero was, actually that's something to try. Okay, yay, it behaved correctly. Um, I, was hope I was hoping to do that. If negative zero was a thing, we would have gotten this actual number here. But since we have to use negative one, we get one less than that because you invert the digits when you sign it, uh, which leads to some very interesting errors. However, it's a very quick way to uh, mess with uh, your different container sizes to figure out how big they are. So since it was able to reach a maximum value of this, which is 2 to the 32nd, we could take the 32nd root of that and we get 2, we know that our integers are given 32 bits in memory. So we could do uh, similar things with like a, a short or some other type of um, storage container if we wanted, or we could just look at a reference sheet, which is by far the best way to do it. This is the most interesting and gives you a little bit of insight into the internal workings of memory though. However, even knowing how memory works, all right, cool, how do we actually do something useful with it? So I'm going to stop this tutorial pretty soon, but we're just going to go through one quick little example of adding two integers. So int my num1 equals or int my num2 equals 7. Now I'm going to add them together. int my num3 equals my num1 plus my num2. Fairly straightforward logic here. C out, my num3, endl, and get rid of this line, build and run, and we should get 11. And we get 11, so everything worked perfectly. Notice I'm not using unsigned here, even though they are positive, because I don't know, maybe I'm going to do subtraction with them or something that may make them negative. So if you're not sure, don't use unsigned. Only use unsigned when you know you specifically want to use it and you've made sure that there's no reason to use a large amount of memory, and that it's not going to overflow or anything, and that you, you have looked into it and you know it'll never be assigned a negative value because that will definitely cause problems. So, it printed out 11. Now, what if we made this a little bit more efficient? You see, by doing this, we're reserving three boxes in, in our memory persistently. They, they, they still exist. Until our program finishes, they're taking up memory. Why don't we make this a little bit more efficient and do the actual math in here? Would that work? My num1 plus my num2. And build and run. Sure enough, 11. So what you can do is you can do math inside of expressions. You don't need to always put it in a box before pulling it out. If you were going to, say, move a keyboard to another room, would you put it back in its box, carry it to the other room and take it out? Probably not. It doesn't really make sense. You can instead just uh, assemble your keyboard or whatever you're doing and then carry it with you. You don't and keep it in um, memory temporarily. It's only kept in memory until it's used. Once it's used in this expression, it's no longer taking up any space because we didn't assign it to persistence. We didn't put it inside of a variable which is going to keep that value. We instead used it in such a way that the computer knows that once it's done with it, it can get rid of it. It's not assigned a name and it's, it's only assigned temporary memory is the best way to think about it. So before we wrap up, just real quick, um, you can do the same thing with subtraction, multiplication, division. You will notice something interesting. I'm going to change this to 7 and 4. 7 divided by 4, you could snap your fingers and go 1.75. Well, C++ disagrees with you. C++ says it's 1. Hmm, how interesting. Integers, since they can only store whole numbers, when you do division with them, they lose the decimal part. They don't round. Uh, rounding is not something that they do. Instead, they truncate the decimal. So I could do 7 divided by 4, and it'd give me 1. I could do 9 divided by 5, which you'd say, oh, 
That should be 1.8. Nope, it's 1. Because C++, or basically any language that's using integers, isn't going to be accounting for decimal places, doesn't have a way to handle decimal places inside of that specific container of integer. Um, of course, there are, are definitely ways, uh, data types that handle um, decimals, the floating point ones, floats, doubles, long doubles. Uh, you can use those to handle decimals. They understand decimals. However, with these, they don't understand decimals, so your results will be truncated. All right, that's about it. One final thing to cover is nomenclature, though, how to name these things. Um, there's several different schools of thought on naming. Obviously the names aren't actually important for the performance of the program, but as you make bigger and bigger programs, readability becomes extremely important. That's why people comment, that's why people uh, make variable names that are descriptive. It's so that when they go back through their code, they understand what's going on, and they don't have to like make up reference sheets and look up this and look up that and refer to old code. And No, no, no. You can just read it through like it's English once you get to that point. And so you can just read through and be like, oh, you took a iterator and added one, or, oh, you're adding five to the balance, or, oh, you're multiplying the balance by the tax rate. So that's why we have things like defines, uh, which we'll get into later, things that make the code more readable. They don't improve performance at all for the actual system running the software, but they make it so as the developer, things are easier to do. Source code, even though two different source codes may generate the exact same binary, one of them is going to be superior due to its readability. However, in some cases you don't want it to be readable, you want it to be very obfuscated in case anyone gets a copy, uh, so there's obfuscation programs which will change variable names, but while you're actually working with the program, writing the program, you always want to keep it descriptive. Anyway, so while we're talking about that though, nomenclature generally dictates that the uh, for just a normal normal variable inside the main method, not talking about global or special or any kind of static or anything like that, but just a normal variable inside of a method or a function uh, that you will define any data type like an int or a string or whatever with the first letter lowercase and then every subsequent word with an uppercase first letter. So my num1. If I called it just 1, I'd, I'd do 1 like that or 9, I'd do 9 like that, but if I said 9 dogs, dogs would be capitalized. The, the first letter of dogs would be capitalized. That's the nomenclature. You don't have to follow it. It's nice to follow. It's what you'll see a lot in code. However, it, uh, the compiler could care less. The computer could care less. It's only a thing to appease humans, but it's good to follow. It makes your code more readable, and it helps to differentiate real quickly when you look at a variable and you can tell oh, that's not global because, simply because of your nomenclature system. And it, it gets very tedious to write global underscore something. So as far as allowed characters, you can use alphanumeric and underscore. However, you can't start a variable name with one, or two, or three, or four, or a digit. You can't do that. That's not allowed. You have to start it with a letter, and then you can use all the other symbols. You can also start it with an underscore, um, yeah, it's going to get mad at us. You can also start it with an underscore. Often that, and we'll get into that later, that's um, also used for other things. It signifies other things in the general nomenclature, but it is allowed uh, in this case, or in any case, to define a variable starting with an underscore, and it's used for other things. You wouldn't use it in this case, normally. You can. Compiler won't care, but nomenclature is good to follow. So, basically, start with a lowercase letter. Each subsequent word it has a capital first letter and you don't start, you can't start with numbers. This will not compile. The compiler does care. That will not work. It'll get mad at you. But I could have a1, and a1 would be a perfectly fine variable name. So keep that in mind. People don't usually tend to have numbers in their names. There's nothing wrong with it. The nomenclature doesn't say you can't, but it, there's just usually not much of a reason for it. Of course, there's times when maybe you have int a1, a2, a3, and a4. Maybe you're implementing SHA-256, so you have h0, h1, h2, h3, etc., the starting primes, things like that. There are reasons to have them. They're not as common to see. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. So, thank you for joining me, and I will see you next time. Next time we'll be talking a little bit more about variables, talking about doubles, longs, floats, chars, uh, and then after that we'll probably be getting into strings, a little bit of string manipulation, and uh, mostly following the path that my Java tutorials took, uh, but maybe taking some little asides here and there to maybe break a program or do something fun with memory.
because when you're in C or C++, you have a lot more access to memory than you do in a lot of other uh, higher level languages, and so you can have a lot of fun just messing with stuff and seeing how stuff works. So, thank you for joining me, and I will see you next time.